Now, I flew these missions. I, I think I flew about 70-some missions over the course of six months. And <clears throat> then they, I was uh, uh, transferred out into the field as what's called a Ford Air Controller. Uh, a Ford Air Controller is a guy who goes out with the ground troops, and if we take any kind of uh, fire or we get into a, a firefight, my job was to call in the airstrikes. And uh, the interesting thing about war, I went to fact school for this to learn how to drop bombs and make sure we didn't drop the bombs on the friendly troops. So I went to fact school uh, to learn how to do that. And my very first mission, I'm transferred out to, to the bush. And those of us in the air wing were not thought of too highly uh, by the ground troops uh, uh, because they thought maybe we were missing all the combat that they got into on an everyday basis. And so I was they looked at me a little bit askance. Uh, second lieutenant, what does this guy know? Uh, you know, so I wanted to show them. Yeah, I may be a lieutenant, but I know exactly how to call in an airstrike. So on the ground, we had several different kinds of missions. The first one was kind of a resupply mission. We would uh, have these things called Amtraks. They look like gigantic steel shoe boxes. Uh, the front end of them opens out uh, and we would pack these with bullets and beans. And then we would go 15 miles, 20 miles to various surrounding hills. And we would deliver the bullets and beans to those locations, which were uh, out in the bush, so to speak. <clears throat> Not very far, really. They were only about 30 miles from, from Da Nang itself, but it was, uh, it was out there. Well, uh, the uh, other kinds of missions uh, that we did, if we would, if we had the intel that we were going to be attacked or or there was a movement somewhere, we would try and cut it off. So we would go out in the bush and uh, skulk around uh, for the for the enemy. Sometimes we found them, sometimes we didn't. And then our primary mission, which was an everyday job. We were on a, a hill, Hill 37, and down below us was a small village. And our main job was to protect that village and those South Vietnamese and to protect ourselves. And so defense was the, the main part of it. But my first, what I would call my, and we, in our hill, by the way, every single night we took mortar fire. Uh, it was, uh, uh, it was, uh, yeah, every single night. So my first, what I would call my combat mission, where I was going to show them that I was a lieutenant in charge, uh, we were on a resupply mission. So we're going on this 15-mile trek down this road with a couple, three or four Amtraks and a tank or two, and uh, we come under sniper fire. And you can hear it. You can hear the bing, 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 clink against the tanks and then you'd hear a crack crack the crack was the ak-47 and once you have heard that sound you never ever forget it and uh and so we know we're under attack and so we immediately jump into kind of a uh drainage ditch my fact team and myself and we're trying to peek up over the ridge of the ditch to see where the enemy is. And so I tell one of my fact team members, I had this about a foot and a half square fluorescent nylon piece of cloth. And I told one of my guys, take this. Put it on your helmet and stand out in the middle of the road uh, so the airplane can see where we are. Now, this was a seasoned kid. He had called in many airstrikes. And he looks at me and he says, with all due respect, Lieutenant, 
is that what they taught you in fact school? I said, yes, I got this from the fact school. He says, well, if you think that's a good idea, why don't you do it? All of a sudden, I thought, putting a fluorescent uh, <laughs> a piece of fabric on the top of my head, I said, that's a bad idea, isn't it? And he said, yes, sir, it is. He says, just get down here in the ditch and hide and watch. And I got, I got down the ditch. I didn't say another word. He keys the mic. I don't think he says 10 words. And in just a few minutes, we have an F-4 flying overhead. And I'll never forget the call sign. The guy says, uh, Black Knight's my name. Killen's my game. Where are they? And my radio man says they're in the they're in the tree line west of us, about four hundred yards. Roger, that's all they said. And this pilot came in. He rolled up down sideways. He came into that tree line and he laid down a line of napalm that was just they were rolling and gigantic fire lit up the tree line. And we were about three, four hundred yards away, maybe more, but you could feel the heat. You could feel the heat of that napalm. It was an would be an awful death. But we began to learn that napalm was our friend. And that was my that was my first combat experience because and as I learned, war is on the job training. You don't know what to do. And I immediately threw away those ideas. I watched what my kids did, and I learned from them. One of our kids, he was a brand new kid. And he was an engineer. He was one of those kids that went before the Amtraks and would sweep the road with one of those things uh, with it looks like a big uh, metal plate on the end of a stick. And he was one of those, brand new in country, discovered a mine. And he went to uncover it, and he hit the wrong button on that mine, and it blew him to bits. And I remember it. I remember the kawump of that. They all make the same sound, kawump, for some reason. And I remember looking up, and I saw this gigantic piece of green something flying through the air and landing right next to me. It was his upper torso. And he was, he found the mine, he was disarming the mine, and he set it off. And he was the only one injured in that because as he was doing that, we all cleared the, cleared the area. He was brand new. Uh, unfortunately, the kids who are brand new take the point, and they're the ones that disarm the mines. Sad, sad truth, but uh, that's the way, you know, it's a numbers game. So not that he was less qualified to disarm the mine, because they're, they were so good at what they do. But the enemy was so good at changing their tactics. I mean, they weren't dummies. They were smart. They were smart. So, yes, uh, booby traps were the daily part of the game. That one particular day, I had a premonition about this particular mission. And I thought, oh. Uh, so I walked the entire 15 miles in the tank treads, the Amtrak uh, treads, uh, so I would not step on a mine. And we had swept the middle, and so we felt fairly safe. So we hopped up on the Amtrak, but there was something interesting about that day. We had no casualties on the way out. Almost every single day we were attacked. and But that day, there was no sniper fire, no nothing. It was just like we were on a, a day's walk. On the way back, we're going along, and I'm sitting in the back of the, of the Amtrak. Kawump! We hit a command detonated mine, which meant there was a little guy out there with his sandpan hat on, and boom, he hit the plunger. There was no way to detect that particular kind of a mine 
<clears throat> because it was made, it was a plastic charge and it would, it would uh, erupt the fuel cells in the bottom of the Amtrak, which would explode. And then we were engulfed in a gigantic ball of fire. <clears throat> I jumped off as quick as I could. And I, I dove over a barbed wire fence. My flak jacket uh, spared me any kind of uh, uh, gashes. And all of a sudden, my radio men said, Skipper, you're on fire. You're on fire. And I looked and I was a flame. And these kids grabbed me, threw me to the ground and started putting out the flames with their bare hands. And they threw dirt on me. And as they took off my flak jacket, which was burning, the skin on my arms, both arms came off. And there was 35 of us that were burned rather severely. Five of them died immediately. They didn't get off the Amtrak fast enough. And you know, in movies, you see the hero, he jumps through a ball of fire and he, his hair is singed and maybe a little soot here and there. That's Hollywood. That's Hollywood. These kids were severely burned. And as the medics, and I'll tell you, uh, medics were actually Navy personnel, but we called them Marines. Because these kids were lifesavers, lifesavers. And by the time he got to me, he said, uh, he said, I'm sorry, but I don't have any more morphine. And, you know, I said, I don't need it. I don't I, I don't hurt. And he says, you're going to. You're going to. And he was right. Well, we went from that field operation and. So here I am, I'm burned. I got my fact to him. I said, we better call in the, 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 the medevacs. And the kid that threw me to the ground, he says, we've already done that, Skipper. And they were on the way, and uh, we were out of there in uh, practically what seemed, like, uh, what seemed like an eternity because the nerve endings that had been uh, severely burned now kicked in, and it was unstoppable pain. And we went to the Da Nang Field Hospital, which was now packed with casualties and dead bodies just everywhere. And I had no idea what happened there. I was so filled with pain medication, morphine, uh, that I had no idea what happened after that. And we, I know we were there for three days, and then we were to be medevac to Yokosuka, Japan, to a burn center. And there again, I have no idea how long that trip uh, uh, took uh, because I was zonked out on pain meds. Either that or you had – the only way you could survive the pain was to, was to be conked out. I mean, it was that severe. And finally, uh, one day I woke up in uh, an interesting thing. We get to Yokosuka, and – they have to check in all the kids. So we're sitting out, <laughs> we're sitting out in the sun, the blazing sun of, of Japan. And that's the worst thing. And I've run out of water and they can't give you water because you haven't been checked in yet. It's a catch 22. And I tell them, I'm going to die right here. I'm screaming, yelling. Eh. And if I don't get water, I can't give you water because we haven't checked in yet. And lo and behold, I start uh, uh, having uh, being delirious and throwing up everywhere. And uh, finally, that got somebody's attention. They got me, the, but I pass out and I awake. I, I, I awake in the in the ward, and a nurse says, "Well, you're you're our miracle patient. Uh, usually, when you get to the stage that you're in, they don't survive." I was that close of escaping the near-death experience on the Amtrak, in the field hospital, uh, having to wait for the paperwork to be done. But that's war is on-the-job training. And they don't plan the hospitals uh, before they start the war, so that's why they're crowded. And I was just one of many. And it was a... But after... Uh, the experience in, uh, they called us, uh, uh, I, I don't know how the medics and the nurses, the 
injuries that they must have seen. Oh, awful. I don't know how they, well, I do know how they kind of survived some of it. Uh, one of the things they had to do was they had to to keep the infection low. We had to take a, 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 a kind of a shower, and it was horribly uh, uh, a horrible shower, and they'd take off all the uh, all the decay and scabs and medicine, and then they'd put on this salve that burned just like you're being burned all over again. And one of those guys, I asked him, "How do you sur- how do you survive witnessing all this?" And he says, "We have to look by it. We have to have some humor, and that's why we call you guys crispy critters." which there was a breakfast cereal called Crispy Critters at that time, and that's what they called us. And they would joke and do the best they could, and they'd say, sorry, I got to do this to you. No, it's going to hurt. That's how they got by. And burns are, the good news about burns is they're superficial. They're not deep. No organs are injured. Uh, But if you can survive the infection and uh, the dehydration that comes from the massive weeping of the wounds, uh, you're going to make it. So after a certain amount of time, you know you're on the road to mend. So after about nearly four weeks there, nearly a month, I was sent uh, home. I finally got sent home. You had to be off all the pain meds. Uh, I kind of fudged a little bit on that one. uh, I wanted to go home bad, as everybody does from that kind of a circumstance. So uh, they said, well, you got to be off pain meds. Sure, okay. I still had pain, and at night I couldn't get any sleep. So uh, I had one of my fellows who could, uh, who was ambulatory go to the PX there on base, and he brought me a fifth of Jack Daniels. <laughs> so that was my pain medication at night was the Jack Daniels. I got off pain medication for two days, got on Jack Daniels, and was able to go home because I was no longer on pain meds. Shame on me. And it was, and I got home a few days early, and it was a marvelous, marvelous experience, the homecoming. Uh, we came into Travis Air Force Base on a on a big old C-130, which was a medevac thing. And some of the kids got off and got down and kissed the ground, and they were that happy. And so then I started the rehab portion in the Oakland Naval Hospital, which absolutely was brand new. And uh, the first night, we actually stayed in some old World War II uh, wards, uh, kind of the green things that you see in the World War II movies. That's what they look like. And uh, then the next day we checked into the brand new hospital. And it was, uh, uh, they gave me 30 days extended leave. Uh, they called it uh, convalescent leave. And so for 30 days and some, and they gave me a big supply of uh, uh, Demerol or uh, tons of uh, uh, pain meds to take with me. And so we returned to my wife had, uh, we had decided that while I was in Vietnam, she had one year left to go to get her degree at Linfield, which is where we met and uh, got married a couple of years after we graduated. And uh, so she was going to go back to school and get her uh, degree in education. So we rented a little apartment in McMinnville, and uh, that's where we went. I was back in on Linfield campus. Uh, it was it was hog heaven, but I had gone from about two hundred and some pounds to a hundred and sixty some pounds. I had a thirty two inch waist. Uh, could hardly walk. Uh, just when you lay in bed that long, your muscle tone evaporates, and so. It was kind of a long uphill battle, but uh, it was uh, the convalescence was very much appreciated. And then we went back down to Oakland Naval Hospital, uh, where I was to check in for about a year for skin grafts, uh, more treatment on the burns that I had. 
And uh, it was turned out to be one of the greatest periods of my life. I count it as one of the best things that ever happened to me. Uh, I was around these kids, and I have a I have a picture here of these kids. You can you can you put that on there? Uh, a I don't know if I'll just show you some of these. A reporter from the Oregonian uh, came to the hospital and interviewed a bunch of Oregonians. And I happen to be one of those. And here it is. I'm checking out. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I'm one of the kids there. And this is the kind of kids that were there. One of these kids, he's from Coos Bay, Oregon. He's missing an arm and a leg. And I'll never forget his statement. He says, there's nothing that's going to keep me from going home to Coos Bay and going fishing and hunting. I'm home. And that is the kind of spirit that I was surrounded with for an entire year by these young men. And I learned that life is, uh, life is very precious and that these young kids were just an inspiration to me for the, for the rest of my life. And so I was uh, going to be sent back to the squadron after I healed up, had uh, had uh, had some skin grafts on my hands. The uh, they were going to send me back to a squadron on flights, uh, but not on flight status. So here I am. Uh, I've now attained the rank of captain. Uh, I. I'm a Vietnam veteran uh, with a Purple Heart, uh, five air medals, and they're going to put me back on a squadron with no flight status, which means I'm going to do all the paper shuffling for the uh, for the squadron, and I've only got six months left to do. They would not uh, they would not let me out, so I took a um, I said, well, I'll, I'll I'll apply for a disability. And so I did, and lo and behold, they gave me a disability, put me on a skids, and I went home, and I can re- I remember to this day bouncing down those hospital stairs knowing I'm going to go home to McMinnville, and my wife's going to finish her, up her degree, and we can get on with life at long last. And I remember that to this day.